Welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us here again. Going to be having a conversation with Dr. Adriana Carrillo Iregi, pediatric endocrinologist within the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology at Nicholas Children's Hospital. She's joining us on the program to talk about the TEDDY study. Uh, it's a national study to find out why type 1 diabetes mellitus, T1DM, is on the rise in children. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Iregi. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I did, of course, mention your uh, position there at uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital. Give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself, and then let's find out why uh, T1DM is on the rise in children. Yes, so um, I did my, I'm from Colombia, I did my medical school in Colombia, and after I did pediatrics here at Nicholas Children's, and I completed my fellowship at the University of Miami where I was uh, an assistant professor for almost 10 years, and I am now working for the past almost uh, seven years at Nicola Children's, and I have a voluntary uh, associate uh, professor with FIU. And um, my passion is to work with kids with diabetes. We're going to talk today about the, uh, the TEDDY study. Is it named TEDDY for a particular reason? Well, TEDDY stands for the Environmental Determinants of uh, Diabetes, basically. So it's it's the Environmental Determinants of Diabetes in the Young. What is uh, T1DM? So uh, the different types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes, is the one that occurs when the beta cells of the pancreas, uh, they're in charge of producing insulin. They normally make insulin, and they are destroyed by the body owns immune system through something that we uh, known as antibodies. So if the cells are destroyed, the body can no longer make insulin. So that's referred to type 1 diabetes. And we know uh, we can identify at least uh, four uh, types of antibodies um, currently. We have the type 2 in which... There is insulin resistance. We also have like monogenic diabetes. They're caused by um, defects in the production of insulin. So they're very different uh, diabetes. They there's no one better than the other. Uh, they have uh, usually same similar complications in some uh, types of diabetes more complex than in the others. When it comes to diabetes in children, are the complications the same because they're so young as they would be in an adult who develops diabetes later on in life or even much later in life? Well, the diabetes management has changed. Uh, so if we talk about complications, we have the acute complications, so which uh, they go from low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, to uh, very which is very could be very serious, but uh, also the opposite, which is when you have like severe hyperglycemia and in, and you go into something that we call we call diabetic ketoacidosis, which are the acute complications and they can be life threatening. And for the long complications, uh, in good enough, we have the technology, the insulin treatment that can help to lessen the. Uh, um, complications in, in in children and adolescents but as you can understand sometimes it's not it's sometimes it's access to to the treatment sometimes it's just the age especially for teens uh, they go through rough time and so compliance to to treatment sometimes is difficult and we'll see, sadly uh, you know we see complications uh gastroparesis, neuropathy that should occur in, you know, people who have chronically longer diabetes that we can see very, very soon. Uh, we're talking about like five, seven years, uh, kids with uh, complications of this type, especially because some of them, they develop diabetes very young at one or two years, and we're seeing an increase at that age in diabetes overall especially in Hispanics, has, um, it's on the rise. So this, this TEDDY study, what were the criteria for participants for the study uh, subjects? Yeah, so basically, the, so this study, it's, um, it has been um, done in six centers, uh, three in the U.S. in the States and three in Europe. And basically what they did, they screened almost half a million newborns 
and they screened for uh, genetic risk. So it's called HLA, uh, DRDQ, which is that uh, some of those that give uh, high risk for type 1. So they're, they're called high risk couple types for type 1. So of this almost half a million newborns, uh, at least 2% had high risk uh, HLA, uh, almost 9,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, of this, almost 10%, they had a relative to type 1 because we know a uh, relative of type 1, they have a higher risk uh, of diabetes. Uh, so in the general population, it's about 1 in 300, and they have at least 1 in 20. So the majority of the patients with high risk, uh, haplotype, did not have a relative with diabetes. And after this, so they, they had a control group of almost 8,000 kids who were not at risk, and they uh, became like a close cohort. They were um, involved by four months of age, and they would follow up almost every three months for the first four years, and after every six months until they um, either developed diabetes so they were 15 years old. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting study. Uh, the parents field questionnaire, they have the Teddy book, uh, all the information, uh, vaccinations, infections, uh, food, everything was in that uh, diary. And then the kids uh, will have blood, nasal swabs, saliva, urine, stools, even the, the nail clips. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the water that they drink, they were collected. And uh, activity started being measured at five years of age. So the, of these kids, about 8% had developed um, antibodies. So the high, we're talking about the high-risk group. Uh, and 3% had developed type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So through that, uh, you know, some of the interesting results was that they could identify, which we wasn't described before, two phenotypes on diabetes, depending on the antibody which you presented first. So for the first time, we talk about like two, you know, we, we knew type 1 diabetes as a whole, but with the study, you know, we start seeing, okay, if you develop this antibody first, how's your genetic part? if there was any metabolic part that were also related, and that's what they found. They found two uh, main groups. One was called GADA first for the GAT65 antibody, mm -hmm. and the other one was called insulin antibody first. They found um, there's some metabolomic biomarkers that they, they are clue on the different food types. They found, for example, that there's a persistent presence of enterovirus B, in the child's stool that can predict highly uh, autoimmunity, which, uh, in, you know, there's some knowledge about enterovirus being part of the environmental trigger for type 1 diabetes. So this kind of also went along with that. And then um, they went to start, they found also that the different composition of the gut microbiome and the, the uh, use of early probiotics um, could decrease the risk of type 1 and interesting also, the use of antibiotics was not related to islet or celiac autoimmunity. In a very interesting part, they found there was a potential beneficial effect on vitamin D, vitamin, D, vitamin C, or a diet rich on uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So those are observations in which more clinical trials are, you know, are um, needed to confirm this observations, mm -hmm. but there are very interesting uh, findings. Well, where can our listeners get some more information about this study online? So there's a website, you know, look for Teddy, uh, Teddy Study or Teddy and Diabetes. It sounds redundant, but that's the way the internet works. So, and then you find, um, in the website, you find how the study was planned, and then there's a part of, in which you can find all the different um, uh, findings, uh, different uh, publications. Uh, there's many papers out about the Teddy study that you can also get from that website. And I think that we can get more information about Nicholas Children's Hospital at nicholashealth.org. That's N-I-C-K-L-A-U-S-H-E-A-L-T-H dot org. Dr. Arecki, I, I do appreciate you joining us here on the program this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. 
You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download a SoundCloud, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.